Hello. Welcome to another episode of Season 16 of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. In each episode, we both watch the same movie on our own and then record a conversation together about what we liked, what we hated, if we were scared, and maybe even some larger truths about why people watch horror movies in the first place. This season, the theme is B-Movies for C-Students. We're taking a break from the current trends toward elevated horror and examining the history of horror B-Movies and how they've developed over time. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Feels like we're really rocketing through season 16, doesn't it? It, it definitely does. <laughs> but don't change. <laughs> Call me off guard. Good. That's what I'm here for. Keep you on yeah. your toes. Yeah. We are doing a season on the history of B-movies in horror mm-hmm. and how they started and how they have changed over time. And we're doing two movies from each decade, from 1930 to the 2020s. And this week we are continuing in 1950, or in the 1950s, but we're going back to the year 1950 to do the movie Rocket Ship XM. You suggested this one. How did you know anything about it? Uh, I don't remember how it came on the radar. However, I thought it was a cool name and Lloyd Bridges was in it. That's how I... That's specifically why I picked it. Fair enough. <laughs> I was like, Rocket Ship XM? That's a dope name. It is, yeah. And then, well, also, you know, it's 50s, sci-fi, sci-fi horror. I was like, it's, let's just do it, you know? What's the worst yeah. thing happened? And for some reason, I probably had, like, watched a YouTube video or something on Lloyd Bridges because, you know, he's a, he was a funny dude. and Or maybe I was reading about him when watching, like, Hot Shots Part 2 or whatever. But... Uh, I knew that he had done like a lot of B movies like early on in his career. And so then when I saw him in the fifties, I was like, Oh, this, this has to be a B, <laughs> this has to be a B movie then. Cause that's what, whatever I was reading said. So just went with it. It feels right that both of our movies from the fifties were sci-fi and outer mm-hmm. space based. Yeah. That seems like very much a, a thing from the time. And oh yeah. I think there are even more similarities than that with the movie we watched last week. But last time we did Plan 9 from Outer Space and got into a lot about how Ed Wood basically just willed it into existence Mm -hmm. and made it on practically no budget whatsoever. And we mused that perhaps Ed Wood was the B-movie MVP. Yeah. This week we're going to be introduced to another strong contender for that title. Mm -hmm. And his name is Robert L. Lippert. Yep. His Wikipedia page picture made me so happy. And Lippert owned a bunch of movie theaters and helped finance over 300 films, most of which were pretty low budget. Apparently, he was known as the King of Bees. And he, at one point, had said about himself, the word around Hollywood is Lippert makes a lot of cheap pictures, but he's never made a stinker. That was kind of how he defined himself. (laughs) And, uh, you know, don't. Talking in third person and fully embracing your yeah. persona is the king of B-movies. Like, yeah, pretty badass. I I don't know what this guy sounds like, but I like to think he has like a gruffy voice just based off of his Wikipedia picture. Yeah, based on the size of that cigar, there's no way. Uh, he probably sounds about like I do in the throes of allergy season. <laughs> right now. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But yeah, so this... We're going to get a little bit more into Lippert Pictures and a little bit more into kind of how this movie compares to Plan 9 from Outer Space and other B-horror movies that we've talked about this season. Uh, And then we'll get into the people in the 50s sure overestimated the amount of math around fuel mixtures that would be done by the average astronaut during space travel, didn't they? Details. God dang, that was nice. In 1950, Lippert Pictures brought us Rocket Ship XM, a science fiction horror B-movie about a trip to outer space that doesn't go as planned. This movie tells the story of five astronauts who get knocked off course while trying to go to the moon and find themselves on Mars instead. While there, they encounter a dark projection of what the future of humanity could be if we ever got our hands on solar night. Er, I mean, if we keep developing nuclear weapons. Sorry, wrong movie. 
Anyway, this movie was made on less than $100,000 and was shot in 18 days. It can currently be rented for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. I think the 18 days is just a prime example of B-movie, uh, considering with like the set. With the so it gets even thing. better. Uh, <laughs> they did it in two and a half weeks in order to steal press from another movie. Hell yes. <laughs> what was the other movie? Planet Knife? I was well, apparently Lippert knew the business and like kind of how to like leverage opportunity. And early on, like he did, he did a lot of creative stuff over time. Like he would add co- a color tint to a black and white movie. And that was a way to like really cheaply make it stand out. So like the there were the scenes on this one where they were on Mars and everything just had the kind of that red tint. And apparently he did that in some of his other movies around the same time. But this movie was also apparently made when a much higher profile movie about space travel called Destination Moon had some production delays. Oh, shoot. So I guess there was like Destination Moon had like a really famous director and there was a lot of like money spent into marketing it. And then there was this window where people had seen all the ads and were like excited for it, but the movie was delayed. So Lippert was like, well, I've got money and two and a half weeks. And then he just made rocket ship XM (laughs) and rushed it into theaters before the other one could be released. And so because of that, this actually became the first post-World War II, like space drama movie and just totally stole that title and, a lot of the public sentiment from the ad campaign from another movie. That's, um, I feel like that's the equivalent to like, I don't know if you've ever seen like those people that run like marathons or like doing a bicycle race and they're like celebrating too early right before the finish line. And then someone (laughs) that's like just hustling. (laughs) Yeah. Just flies past them. It's like the equivalent for that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how this one came to be. I think that may help explain a little bit of the story being kind of all over the place at times. But after having read all that about it, I was expecting something of way lower quality than this actually was. Mm -hmm. And even though this was made, you know, it was on a higher budget than Plan 9 from Outer Space, obviously. But it still felt like a real Hollywood production by comparison. And the only thing in this one that really stood out to me as being like poorly done or like hurt by lack of funding was just the sound. I had to turn on subtitles cause I had such a hard hey. time hearing it. Interesting. I don't know if I ran into that. Um, did you watch it on prime? Yeah. Did you do the free subscription, the trial scrip- subscription? No, they burned me too many times before. Nobody remembers to turn that off until the first billing period hits. This guy did. Right here. As soon as the movie was over with, because I don't trust Prime. Anyways, it's like indie picks or something like that that you can do a seven (laughs) day. And so I did it. I didn't necessarily have any audio issue. Um, I noticed also when I watch things on Max, the audio is the worst. Oh, weird. Yeah. Just that's why I was curious. Kind of do my own experiments over here. Yeah. Uh, You know what's crazy about this, though? Like, the thing I kind of kept tripping out with this film was thinking how this was 19 years before we landed on the moon. Yeah. Like a film. I I mean, anyway, uh, it was just tripping me out while watching this. I was like, they're not even, do we allow some of the mistakes of like, you know, when they're about to land on Mars and they see earth and it's like right there, you know, obviously that's, it's not necessarily the case. It would be, kind of like what we have with Mars now just reverse is that allowed because it was kind of before we were really fully up there you know I think there is a little bit of a pass that they should get with it but it was just like gosh how exciting is it they don't know that we're going to be on the moon in 19 years but how exciting is it this like unexplored territory it's almost like a western in of sorts but um, anyway it just was blowing my mind thinking that it came out almost two decades before we landed on the moon. I had similar feelings just from the perspective of, I feel like the first half of this movie dragged hard. Mm, And I wondered if 
some of that is because like we know how it really works and we know how the space oh. shuttle went up into space. Like that's a thing you learn about now, or at least we did, you know, when we were kids. And so this whole idea of, you know, the multi-stage rocket and burning the fuel and then ejecting that part of the rocket and the idea of how you would need to like reverse thrust and get down onto the surface of the moon. It's just like, if that had never been done before and it was being presented in a way that was like kind of real and plausible Mm -hmm. to the average person who'd never even thought about like the logistics of how it would work or something, maybe that intro part would have been a lot more interesting, but it, to me, it was just like, Oh man, come on guys, let's, let's get to it. Yeah. I mean, I actually technically watched this movie twice, uh, or I didn't watch it fully twice. The first time I'd stopped and I, I was almost like, regretting the decision because i was like damn this movie has to almost be over with and like what <laughs> yeah. you know horror do we have here and then turned it off went back and it saved your you know saved my place and i think i was only like 20 minutes into it or it was before they even hit mars <laughs> and uh, i was just like oh no it was just dragging ass like that's exactly why you you know you slow you stop but i could definitely see that for sure I think there was a lot of talking early on. Um, yeah, the part in my notes <laughs> that is probably the best summary of that is something finally happened and we're like 40 minutes into a 75 minute movie. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was definitely a slow burn at the beginning. And I mentioned before that I, I didn't, by comparison, this felt very professional compared to like plan nine from outer space. Mm -hmm. And I think the set was definitely a lot more convincing. There was not nearly as much cardboard, but I also felt like there was a surprising amount of just stuff on camera pretty much all the time, but it wasn't always convincing. So like, it was cool that they created the backdrop of like the space capsule, but I'm pretty sure none of the dials on any of the machines ever actually moved. And there were no flashing lights or anything. So when things were going wrong, it was just like random sounds and the characters all like acting super worried. But then they'd show like them looking at a panel where everything was just like completely to the left yeah. or something. And so there were a few things in there that were a little bit distracting, but none as much as the random times that gravity would be there or not be there. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, well, why is the harmonica floating, but not the guy's tie, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, that was definitely what I thought was the casualty of uh, <laughs> 1950s. It's like, oh, I mean, I think that's probably one of the things that made me think of it was just like, like they definitely didn't grasp the concept of it, uh, obviously, well enough for that, you know, especially. It certainly wasn't convincing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the only like, I think this is a prime example of a B movie. It's set is small this cast was small, you know, it, yeah. for, for the most part, you know, for the most part, you got, you know, all just the, the crew of the ship, um, except for the very beginning and very in, in basically. Um, but the, the, the earth and Mars shots were the ones that was like, Oh, that's, that's cardboard. That's my cardboard. If, if this was planet nine or planet nine, uh, like I was just definitely kind of thrown off a little bit by it, but what are you getting like distractingly do? bad? Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, Oh, you look at it. And it was just like, you know, just look like a ball or like a blob, you know, it's just, I don't know. That was, that was like the main beef. Other than that, I, I actually thought it was pretty clever how they, how they did the, uh, going under the ship to check the engines, to try to figure out why they stopped running and, and all that, like just clever in the sense of like, you know, cutting the scene. Now they're down below the ship or next to the ship and they're in the ship, but they're just in another area. And it kind of was the purpose, I think, to show how big whatever they were on was. But yeah. I, then it was I, like, I well, like... wait, they didn't even, we hadn't even gone to the moon yet. And this movie is about at, going to Mars. Like these people were just, they shot for the stars, man. Literally. They were just, you know, like, you know, screw the moon. There's this destination moon movie coming out, whatever that was called. I can't remember. Uh, one up. Yeah. It's like, we're going to Mars with this one. <laughs> it was funny in this one though, that they all wake up and they're like, 
oh no, we messed up and we fired ourselves off into space, but we're almost to Mars. Guess we'll just check this place out. <laughs> like, Might as well just stop. <laughs> after 40 minutes of scientific explanation of like all the reasons it was going to be super hard to land on the moon. And then they yeah. were like, oh, cool. We'll, ch- we'll just do this one instead. And the solution was like, we're just going to go around and parallel line. And all of a sudden we're going to hit a 90 degree turn. <laughs> it's yep, like, exactly. bet. It's, that sounds great. Yeah. It was funny for like as much math as they had to do on the ship. That they didn't just pack a calculator. You, you know, it's as easy as that, if I'm being honest with everyone here. It would, it would have taken away a lot of the drama and a lot of the math flirting that was going on. 100%. So, you know. Yeah, the most uh, stressful part was them, like, all of a sudden doing, like, a math quiz. And you're just like, what are you nerds doing here? He's like, Wing these it. equations are going to take six to eight hours to work out. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I just, I would just crash the ship. But... <laughs> Um, I think the most interesting parts of the movie were once they actually made it to Mars. And yeah. I actually liked the goofy visual effect that made everything kind of like red sepia tone. Yeah. Yeah, I did too, actually. It, it was a good, it, it was an interesting change, I think, was mm-hmm. the thing. Like it was, you know, we're on the red planet, you know? Yeah. And I think for the most part, this movie did a good job of staying within its technical boundaries. Like, it didn't try to pull off effects that it couldn't pull off for the most mm-hmm. part. It yeah. was definitely made on a budget and had limitations, but even I was really curious what the Martians would be like. And so the fact that they went a route where they could just kind of have prehistoric looking people running around and throwing rocks that actually worked on a low budget, you know? Yeah. It, you know, I think as, as well as like the, guns that were being used were like actual Mm -hmm. like real life looking not like you know uh laser guns or you know or whatever you know that albeit is more in more fun to to play around with and maybe look at if it's you you think you have a ray gun out there um the effect itself it's just those could have been real guns with no no bullets in it they're trying to save money it's a b movie you know so Hmm. Yeah, so the Mars discovery was interesting just because I feel like the movie didn't really tip its hand as to what they were going to find once they got there. But once they did, man, did it get preachy. It was just going, man. <laughs> they, Because I, when we watched Plan 9 from Outer Space, it was so all over the place that you kind of had to like look past what was happening to figure out what they were trying to get at. Yeah. And it's like, okay, the idea here is this is like a parable about, you know, we should really rethink the way we're treating the proliferation of and development of nuclear weapons. This one, you didn't have to look past anything. They just talked about that for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. And they tried to make it so dramatic. And there were just all these lines that got me is they'd be like, one blast, thousands of years of civilization wiped out. And it's like, you weren't even here. This is pure speculation as to what's even going on. But now I'm realizing like everything on Mars is just set up for you to wax poetic about um, atomic age to stone age. And we must get back to earth. Tell them what we found. Maybe this will. And then he dies dramatically. (laughs) It's just like, come on guys, we get it. You could, you could introduce some subtlety and still get the message across. Well, you know, I also just feel like pure speculation was, is what you could just call the cold war. Two, which is what they're basically referencing and what they're in the full, you know, it's just speculation here. Obviously they're doing it, but we're just going to say they're doing it worse. And they're going to say we're doing it worse. No one knows what the hell's going on, man. I mean, that, that kind of a tale of the ages, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do th- think the, the whole, I think that if you, dipped out of the movie to go take a leak if this was in the theaters and then like right before they got to Mars and then all of a sudden you come back and there you wouldn't know what the hell was going on. I'm not saying that from experience or anything. Right. It was for confusing sure. yeah. initially. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what the hell what the hell happened? Like they were on the ship for seemed like five fucking hours. Now it's red. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't recognize anybody. People are getting pinned under rocks. What's rocks happening? Are through, hey, by, yeah. did, did I put on another movie here? What the hell is happening? Yeah. Yeah. Why are they spending the night in a cave? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so crazy. I really only had one other main thing in my notes. Hmm. And that was the lead up to and including the ending. Mm. And I got, I really, really pulled like an about face on my assessment of it. Oh. Cause you know, we talked about like a lot of times with the movie, you're bored for a lot of it, but then yeah. the way they land the ending has like an undue influence on how you feel about it after the fact. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you with the Floyd and Lisa love story, just being awkwardly thrust to the front of the movie as mm-hmm. they were coming up on the ending, I was checked out. I was like, I am done with this crap. Like they very clearly have just decided that they had to do something to make you care about the remaining characters. So now they're going to randomly be in love after encountering each other for like three days. And, Oh, they're going to make you really hope that they survive. And are they going to have enough fuel? Will they be able to pull it off? But no, they're going to land and they're going to live happily ever after. And this is going to be a typical 1950s Hollywood movie with mm-hmm. a predictable, boring ending. Oh, my God, they just crashed and died. <laughs> That's the journey yeah. I took. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They weren't playing around with this one, man. They well, were not, not only did they just crash and die, the response was basically saying, like, XM2 goes out. What do they say? Like next week or something like, like the, they were just like, yeah, that sucks. Yeah. They were just like, Oh no, this is great. It proves space flights possible. So it wasn't a failure, even though yeah. everyone died tomorrow, we start the construction of our XM two. And yeah, yeah. That, that was just a little bit of a twist on like, I, I think it was meant to show the way that humanity can get lost in the pursuit of technology, but it also read very much as a, Giant corporation doesn't care about people and you're right. the world will move on without you when you're gone, which is a really kind of dark horror apropos ending in my opinion. Well, and I was there for it. Well, I mean, you know, and if you think about it, like, do we know the names of all the astronauts that went up first and, and crashed and burned? Or do we know the names of the astronauts that landed on the moon first? You know, fortunately, I don't know. I don't know their names. I think one of the Russians' name was Yuri, but that's just a that's a 50-50 shot. Yuri Gregarin, I believe. Thank you. Yeah. So it's it makes sense to me, man. I'm with it. I think that no, not really. I was actually really surprised that it was I mean, everything was pointing towards like what you're saying the first half of like uh, okay. It's 50s. They have to have a happy ending. You know, this and that. It's like, no, it's the 50s, but it's f- B-movie 50s. That's a different right. universe that we're in here. It doesn't have to. Yeah, and it was just like, okay, they're throwing together this love story at the last minute just so they can live happily ever after mm-hmm. and like totally pull the punch of the movie and everything. But I, I appreciate the follow-through and them like really doubling down on trying to – kind of drive home the seriousness of the point they were trying to make. So even though it was a little preachy and over dramatic in how they did it earlier in the movie, I thought the ending was great. Yeah. yeah and I, I just don't feel that way about movies all that often. So <laughs> hats off to him. Yeah. I mean, thank for, you, Mr. Lippert. Thanks, Mr. Lippert. Um, I think the yeah, I think that the thought of it, just how slow it started, it sure did burn out pretty fast. I was cool with it. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know that this one would necessarily be at the top of my recommendation list from this season, but I am glad that we watched it, and I'm glad that we found out about Lippert Pictures. And it's interesting, you know, to kind of see the way that the the subject matter of these movies has changed over time. Because we started off, and it was just like, okay, adventure, kind of Mm treasure-seeking, danger kidnapping torture and then we get into kind of more scientific experimentation and what comes out of that we get into you know this curse of the cat people and then now we've ended up with two movies in the 50s that are both very much around technological advancement and the danger potential danger of nuclear technology 
And it's just like, okay, wow, that really was at the forefront of people's minds and like what could excite and scare them. And that's just like, it's hard to understand that now, but going back and kind of watching these movies in that context, I I just found it really interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, we've definitely touched, touched base on this before, but like really it's almost like what's relevant in society. And then that's going to spur love stories and that's going to spur, spur comedies and that's going to spur, you know, horror. And obviously space travel was huge during this time. Uh, so definitely makes sense. I mean, obviously we got yeah. two B movie outer space films, same decade. Yeah. Another thing I, I thought was really interesting and unique about this one was just the idea that it totally hijacked the hype train from another movie. Mm-hmm. And, That's always kind of been, you know, the thing with B-movies is they're trying to find their niche or they're trying to find their way for the least amount of money to capture the most public interest. And just bravo on this one. (laughs) I really, I really applaud uh, the audaciousness of making a movie in 18 days just to seal someone else's PR. The only thing that can make this better is if it was Ed Wood and he would did it with the money from the Baptist <laughs> church. Like that's yeah. the only thing that can make that better. Yeah. Just like yeah. the biggest screw you to society basically. Yep. So yeah, that's it. That's it for yeah. the fifties. We are sailing right along. We'll be back next week with our first movie from the sixties and it is not about space travel or nuclear weapons. So if you're getting burned out, you're about to get refreshed. If you're getting burned out, you're going to crash in Nova Scotia. That's where they died, right? I think so, actually. Good. Good. I would not have been able to recall that, but when you said it, I was like, yeah, that sounds exactly right. It's just a funny word. Yeah. Pour one no, out for was also like supernova, Nova Scotia. Is, I was just putting too much thought into nothing, you know. Per use. I get it. It's been a long day. Yeah. All right. What are you guys still doing here? Can you Leave. not take a hint? The episode's over with you. It. Bye bye. Go. Weirding me out. And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas, so if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions, please send us an email at thehorrificpod at gmail.com, or hit us up on the IG. That's what the kids call Instagram. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening.